to start. Yeah. All right. So, hello, everyone. We have Neil Koshik here, who is a high school student in, I don't know, the Newtown, Pennsylvania. Yes, Newtown, Pennsylvania. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he's uh, what in uh, Indian uh, grade school system we call 10th grade right now. Uh, two years ago, when he was in eighth grade, he did a project with us, which went to a science fair on cycloidal pendulum. And he won, I believe, the second prize in the competition for that. So I guess he's going to present that work to us here. All right. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to play around with the uh, the board and share screens. But um, so I, I was thinking first, I'll start with some history. Um, I think we sent a video. It was a video I took a couple years ago when I was doing the project and I recorded it and submitted it. But um, I'll, I'll try sharing my screen for now. Can you all see this or? Yes. Okay, so um, th this is the slideshow I made a couple years ago for the um, for the fair. So I'll, I'll start with this since this is good history about uh, the thing. So it, basically what I did was I took a cycloidal pendulum and I showed how uh, the properties of a cycloidal pendulum improved what simply a simple pendulum is. Um, so a simple pendulum is a device used to keep time consisting of a mass that hangs from a string, which is fixed at a pivot point. And so in, in the early 1600s, Galileo studied these properties, and this revolutionized the modern science and paved the way to experimentally verifying scientific hypothesis. He found that the time period of a simple pendulum, simple pendulum was independent of the mass of the swinging bob, but more importantly, he discovered that the simple pendulums were isochronous. So they take time to come the same time to complete one oscillation despite being released from uh, different angular displacements. So this was his big mistake. Uh, basically, this was completely wrong. Uh, in history, simple pendulums were used to keep time and time was wrong because of this, um, since there is an error, which I'm going to show later, but um, just to clarify, uh, sorry, if you guys can see my screen. Um, uh, and I hope this is good, but if you take a normal setup and take a pendulum over here and then say another one, except you release it from over here. So the time it would take for one period he assumed that the one period of one oscillation would be the same in both of these pendulums. However, he was wrong and uh, they are different. And that's going to be shown later. I'll go back to sharing. So he found that he, he thought that they were isochronous. He was wrong. Um, and in 1636, Marin Mersenne, in discussion with Rene Descartes, showed that the time period of pendulum changes with the amplitude of oscillation. Uh, and this is seen in larger amplitudes and over a course of large a larger number of oscillations. So two, as just shown, two pendulums released at different angular displacements were not isochronous. I'm, I'm going to go and just show the derivative um, sorry, how to derive these uh, pendulum functions. And what you can note here is it's very simple. It's very easy um, in terms of deriving it. It's simply just uh, Newton's second law. So, Hello, am I audible? So I have a question here. Yeah, of course. Did Galileo really say that it was uh, that it, it is independent of the amplitude? Yeah, yeah, he said that they they, they were isochronous. This was his mistake. Yes. 
I don't know. Can you guys see my writing? Uh, I'm not sure how the glare is working over here. It's a small glare there, yeah. But now I think it's. Uh, it's is it full? Is it full screen for you? Or uh, can you bring the camera closer? I can try. This is. Uh, so that it fills the the board fills more of the yeah, screen. Better, a yeah, little more closer better. and it will be perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is as close as it can go, but it is, it is my screen like pinned on yours or what? I think it has to be done at the personal level. You can explain that maybe. Yeah, so I mean, I think it would be better just pin the video. Uh, I mean, I pinned it for myself, so it's really visible for me. But if you pin my screen, it should be quite visible. But so yeah. The right corner of each of our video, there are three dots. If you click on that, you see pin. And if you click on that, it will make the person you want full screen. That helps typically. Okay. All right, uh, I'll just continue yeah. then. So I'm just yeah. gonna draw a simple pendulum just to start it off. Uh, so say from right here and then i'm going to just show the forces so of course we have uh, tension coming in this direction and then we have force of gravity or just mg um, or whatever mass there was and then here we have mg cosine Theta, and then here, it's. M. I have a question again in the context of Galileo, like that. What does isochronous mean? Yeah, so uh, I can explain. So isochronous. So um, if I draw, say, two pen, one pendulum, and I release this from here, whatever uh, this angle is, and I say, okay, now I'm going to release it from an angle that's okay it's going to be a lot larger than this angle but the time period of one oscillation if the pendulum is isochronous the time period of one oscillation in this should be the exact same as the time period for this one uh, so why is the amplitude known as chronus what is the, is there any uh, connection or what's the why is an angle dependence associated with chrome any uh, I think I'm, sorry, sorry, I was. I think I was planning on explaining that a little bit okay, later. Okay, I'll wait. I'll wait. But um, I guess I'll just continue with this. So, mg cosine theta and tension force they'll cancel out. So we here we have the net force is mg sine theta. So I should write out the net. Um, you have this is one side, and then this equals uh mass times acceleration and acceleration um, is simply like second derivative of displacement which that's the second derivative of displacement and here we have um so say this right here is the length of the string because the length of the string does matter in here the displacement that this will go on is simply apologize Sorry, so if this is theta, which means which makes this theta, the displacement is simply L theta. And so in order to get the acceleration, we take the second derivative of this, and that is oh, sorry. All right. So I can just I'll just write that here. All right. Okay, so one thing you notice is that mass cancels out on both sides, which shows that mass, as Galileo was right about this, mass is independent um, of this function. So if we just remove the mass from both sides, we get minus g sine theta 
equals the length right here. And then, so if we just put L over here, it's Maybe you need to keep yourself muted, Shajesh, until you're speaking. Oh. Shajesh is now able to hear. Oh, we have kids around, so I think. No, no, I'm saying Shajesh, is Shajesh able to hear our sound and, uh, and the speaker's sound? I mean, because he had an audio issue. Uh, I got it all fixed. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so I mean, this is what you end up with, and I mean, you can clearly tell uh, it's it's a simple derivation. All we're doing is just uh, the net force of this, and then the second derivative of uh, the the displacement. And uh, you can note that this is very similar to simple harmonic motion, uh, which would be that. Omega squared, the angular frequency equals zero. And so um, omega squared theta, you meant my I think maybe you want to write x in in place of theta here. Yeah, I'm gonna theta. show that in a second, I think. Right. Yeah, but you forgot uh, theta in the second term. You need okay. to write omega squared theta there. Yes, yes, right. Um but yeah, so the main um the reason why the symbol pendulum is not isochronous is uh, shown in the small angle approximation, right? So what was done, what, what we do is we approximate the value of sine theta to theta. And so I'm gonna explain like the effect of this in a minute, but first I'm just gonna continue this. So if we do that, um, we get yeah. and once we do this we can set mega square to and that results in uh, the equation which is simple harmonic motion. And then what we can also get is, I think I wanted to share this part. Uh, wait, no, no, sorry. Um, we also know since omega is the angular frequency, uh, if omega equals two pi over T and so then if we plug that into this function, yeah, we get t equals 2 pi over the length over g. And I'm pretty sure that's what it is. This is the time period. If you make the small angle approximation, uh, for the simple pendulum. Uh, so you can tell that length is the main factor, uh, the length of the pendulum in terms of determining the time period. So again, so, so what does isochronous mean? Uh, isochronous means the time period would be the same if the oscillations, if, sorry, if the pendulum was re released at different amplitude. So my question again is, did Galileo say that it is independent of amplitude? I thought he only said time period is square is proportional to the length. Did he really say that it is independent of the amplitude? I think, I'm pretty sure. That's what I, that's, that's what I had in my um, presentation. Because these equations were not available to begin with. So he might have depended on experiments and is probably yeah. where is experiments precise enough at that time? Just yeah. curious because of course, uh, yeah. say Galileo is wrong. It's the significant. Right. Um, 
So I guess uh, I wanted to just show, like, just illustrate the effect of the small angle approximation. So, so it, it only depends on small angle approximation and not amplitude, right? In the small angle approximation is about the amplitude. Because you could just make L very large. And you could keep yes, uh, uh, um, yeah, you'll see in like museums, L is always very large to reduce the error, but still, um, so I, I think that is what is usually done. Uh, but yeah, again, um, so does L very large accommodate for the small angle? I mean, it should. Uh, that's how museums have done it. Um, like when you walk into a museum and you see the, like the very large and long pendulum, they try to make the pendulum with as long as a length as possible to make it as accurate as possible. But even if you have a very long pendulum and if you make the amplitude large, you will make the same error, right? Theta, I thought, was not independent on L. So you're saying that if the um, the error should be the same with the longer length? Correct. Because it's just the amplitude of the, yeah, for a long pendulum, you'll have to go farther in distance, but angle is independent of that distance, right? Yes. Wouldn't I be right, John? But angle. Well, I mean, like there's a different, but so, so there, there's no condition, the amplitude is S, correct? So like you haven't imposed any condition on the amplitude yet. You've only imposed condition on the angle. So so, at, so as as of now, uh, it's only I'm, I'm so, I, I so, uh, isochronic. I think yeah, you're saying it's only isochronic when there's small angle. Yes. But uh, I uh, unless you have some condition on the amplitude, you mean condition on s. I I think you could only say. Uh, I mean, you could only say that it's uh, isochronic based on this angle and not the amplitude itself. Right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think the length is actually a longer length results in less error. I think that's what um, we deduced. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm sure. So. Okay. But yeah, I just yeah, want it's to... easy. There's less errors exactly. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to illustrate the. Um, the small angle approximation, uh, just to show what the result is. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to make a table. So here's theta, and this is going to be in degree. This is going to be in degrees. Just to, I guess that just gives you like a more, um, like it helps understand it more. And then I'm going to convert it to radians. I'm going to take the sine of that value. And then I'll show the percent error here. So simply, if you have, if we start with, if theta is 10 degrees, then radians 0.174. The sine value is just about 0.174. Uh, and we, so the error is, it's not actually 0%, but it is somewhat, um, it's closer to zero than one. Uh, and then, if you go up to, I'm just going to do a few. If you do 20 degrees, it's 349, 342, and it's just about 2% error. And then I'll go up to 40 now. So 40 degrees in radians, uh, 698. And you get, and just about 8.6% error. So obviously a big difference in that. And then say we did, we went up to 70 degrees. Uh, so this is the error in sine theta or this is the error in the time period? Sine theta. Uh, I'm just showing the effect of sine theta versus theta and how like how this angle approximation has much bigger effect in, different, in larger amplitudes. Got so, it. Uh, Basically, we end up when we go up to 70 degrees, it's a 30% error. And way back when, before 1630, whatever it was, 
they used to release them from 100 degrees amplitude. And so once this was discovered, they drastically reduced it to about uh, four or six degrees. So give or take, you have uh, like five degrees, which is, uh, sorry, 0 0.87 radians. And we get an 0.1% error. And so this is the amplitude that five degrees and 0.1% error was the amplitude that people were working with. Um, th this is what the simple pendulum was changed to. So I guess this just gives an appreciation of how uh, a smaller amplitude should result. Um, if we're just using a simple pendulum, it should be more isochronous. So, okay, so now I'll start. Um, I think the emitter will have a significant amount of error there, right? During the linear time. Like you wrote this angle as three digits significant. But when they measure the time during Galileo's time, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it will be one six digit. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, would they be able to say anything about that amplitude at all? Would they? I mean, I think they could because, I mean, they went to a very. They were very specific in the fact that. Pendulums had to be between. Descartes was very specific that pendulums had to be four to six degrees. Um, but how would they measure the time at that time? Okay, Shajesh, time was not measured accurately until Galileo invented pendulum. So you are going in circles here. Now yeah, here is exactly. here is the question. Like the point here is that simple harmonic oscillations came into existence with Hoyen, and Hoyen was contemporary time period as Galileo. So if you want to get into the history of it, that's a different story. So Galileo did say that it is uh, I, uh, independent of amplitude. Oh, well, I have not read history books, so I cannot claim one way or another, but I think we can leave it at that. And okay. okay. So I guess I'll start talking about the uh, cycloidal pendulum now. And so due to this approximation, clearly we see that once the amplitude is large and even at a smaller amplitude, there is still error. So it's not isochronic. Um, and so we wonder which trajectory will result in it being isochronous. And that, whichever that would should be, it should result in time period of two pi uh, times the square root of the length over G. And so uh, it was Huygens who brought in the idea of a cycloid. Um, and the cycloid is just simply this uh, shape. Neil, uh, uh, just, just to understand, you know, what you're trying to say. Um, so you are saying that, you know, since we are using this approximation, sine theta is nearly same as theta. Yes. So, uh, as long as that approximation remains true, uh, the time period is supposed to be constant. I mean, it's supposed to stay constant, right? It's but, supposed to be, yes, it's supposed yes, to be. Yes, but, but, but in practice, in practice, um, because sine theta is never equal to theta. Right. So that's why there would be change in the time period, right? Yes, yes. That's what you're trying to say. And yes. I think what, what perhaps Sajesh is trying to get to is that, you know, what was what was the basis for Galileo to say mm -hmm. that it is iso because you have to have a basis to measure the time because the equations of motions were not discovered until then. And uh, so there was no SHM and uh, they had to be able to measure the time period accurately to be able to say that. So what was the basis Galileo had to say that it was isochronous. I think that's what Rajesh's confusion is. Yes, yes, uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because these equations were not available at that time, and that's my exactly. Uh, exactly. worry. Like this is calculus came after Galileo, so I'm trying to yes. understand uh, in my own way as to what- Yeah, yeah. I'm no, not no, makes sense. No, 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 makes sense. Makes perfect sense because how would one know that it is not? 
because the even measurement of time, accurate measurements of time were not there. The whole understanding of simple harmonic motion was not there. Yeah. I, I, I think he measured his pulse. He used his pulse, I think. That is correct. But that would be just one sig digit. Yeah, but we are not talking about accuracy here. You are okay. getting into nitty gritties of the things which are probably yeah. like not appropriate at the level. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, I know that he yeah. had the experiment. Sorry. No, go on. Okay, I know that he Galileo had experiments. Obviously, he didn't have those tools, but uh, he did claim that it had a constant period. So, um, you know, claims can be, but yeah, obviously period with respect to length, right? Like if you fix the length, the t is fixed, and that is true. Even today, it is true, except that there are corrections to that. He, but he, I, I, my point is that did he say that it is dependent on the amplitude, or it's independent of the amplitude? He said that um, I'm reading this right now. If uh, I think it's amplitude, I might be wrong, but it says pendulums of equal length. If they have an equal length, then the oscillation period, regardless of the amplitude of the oscillation, is constant. Okay. Um, yeah, late 16th century. So, but yeah, where it was okay. So, I was just explaining what a uh, cycloid is. So, if you were to take a ball, um, this ball had a radius of r, and you simply at a flat plane and you rolled the ball over, then the shape that this would make as it rolls over is the shape of a cycloid. And so Huygens was able to use this shape um, and create a pendulum that was far more isochronous than the simple pendulum. Uh, I'm gonna just show, so basically I, uh, when I was doing this experiment, I created a simple pendulum and a cycloidal pendulum. And so um, here's just how we created the cycloid part of it since the simple pendulum was fairly simple. Um, So uh, as for a 2D cycloid, which is what we started with, and uh, we had the uh, just parametric equations. I have them where right here, your X and Z. Right. And this is for simply a 2D cycloid and um, we also found that the length, which is obviously important in the uh, period function, which is dependent on length, the length equals or r. And so what I wanted to do was uh, I had to create a cycloid and I wanted to make it so that I could have a length of 30 centimeters. Um, but, yes. Is angle theta the same as angle theta earlier? Probably not, right? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Uh, uh, this angle theta is probably not the same as your angle in the in the pendulum, right? Or is it the same? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, but um, I, I guess I'll just angle made from the vertical. It is always angle made from the vertical. In this particular case, it will be uh, this the radius um if you're following the uh, point right so the, the pendulum angle at this point uh, i couldn't hear you uh it has nothing to do with the pendulum angle that came before this right or it will not have anything to do with it yes being curious. So I think he is not showing the equation yet, but the 
equation for the cycloidal pendulum will only have the difference that instead of d2 theta over dt square, he will have d2 sine theta over dt square, which makes it a simple harmonic motion equation. It will be the same angle. It is the same angle. It is the cycloidal pendulum. The angle is made with the vertical, but length keeps changing as you make angle farther and farther apart. So that compensates. Here the angle is the rotation angle, correct? Um, okay, okay. you are make, mixing up two things here. So I am confusing. Okay, yeah, yeah maybe. The angle is just, if, uh, say you have the pendulum right here, this is, this is the angle right there. Just... Yeah, but the, this angle is brought, like the, when you draw the angle on the wheel, that's not this angle, right? On the wheel, as you're rolling, there is an angle that is yes. uh, evolving. That angle probably is not this angle, right? It might be related to this, or probably it is related, but it's, is it the same? I'm just curious, yeah. I felt it was not, I mean, I don't think that should that angle matter. Or, I don't. Okay. Uh, uh, Neil. Yeah. yeah. This this R that you have written it is the radius of the wheel, right? This x equals R theta minus sine theta. Right? Yes. So what is this R? I'm pretty sure it would be the. Um, so I, I I can show you here. Can you guys see this? Uh, wait, no, it is the no, radius no. of the radius. It is the radius of the wheel, right? So okay. uh, have a... Neil, I mean, you are getting into the uh, design part now. They are still working with the theory. So yes. you okay. will have to stick with the cycloid. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I think if I it. understand it right, so if you have a wheel of radius R and that is rolling on a plane surface, oh, yeah. then theta is the angle that is made by the radius of the wheel. So if you fix a point on the on the on the rim of the wheel, then it is the angle that the radius of the wheel makes with the vertical. Am I right, Prachi? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, and then ultimately, when you will make the cycloidal pendulum, perhaps you know, of course, that will correspond to the theta of the yes. cycloidal pendulum, right? Yeah. Yeah, they are related. Yes. Yeah. And it is the angle made with the vertical. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now I was just going to talk about how we created the cycloid. Um, so uh, if we make a 2D surface, well, the fact of the matter is uh, when you release a pendulum, it's not going to stay perfectly in the same plane. It will rotate. Um, I mean, it can stay in the same plane for a while. But for that, you need to have incredible accuracy. I think the way people do it is they set like a rope uh, just as they're about to release it. They have a rope that's attached on both ends and they'll light a match and, the, and that rope burning will release it perfectly. But we had, we did it from seven different amplitudes and five trials for each. So we decided to just release it with our hands because that would have been, a uh, rope would have been quite tedious, um, like using that. Um, and then also, um, this isn't really related, but, uh, I think pendulums, uh, like the ones that happen, I guess the ones you see in museums, like the giant ones, they're always, they rotate, uh, just as the day goes, uh, over 24 hours, they will eventually rotate, um, uh, and finish and like, they'll turn their plane this way, I think, but. Um, as for this, it was just better to make a 3D surface. Do, so, you know, do you know what is the, what's the, what are those pendulum? What is the effect that causes them to rotate? Uh, I think it's just, is it, is it the magnetic field or? Mm -mm. No, no. I don't know. I read this a couple of years ago. So That's okay. Yeah, it mm -hmm. just came to my mind. Um, but. So uh, obviously it would be much it's better. The rotation else. of the earth, which causes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Rotation of the earth. That would and be... it will not be 24 hours everywhere. It's only on the North Pole that it will take 24 hours to complete. Right. Yeah. It's a function of the latitude. Okay. 
so of course um, we decided to make a 3D surface so that way this would be fixed. Uh, I'll write the parametric equations we use to create it. So did you print that? Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll show that in a sec. Um, I'll just show how we made it, so. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, and then um, the idea was we, this is just for normal cycloid and we're using an inverted cycloid. So all you have to do is subtract the diameter of this, which is just two R minus uh, what's over here. And that gives you the new Z, which is, that and um, I have a picture of what we, uh, I'll share this. Uh, so this was the picture that was created um, using the parametric equations for the cycloid. Um, and so this, uh, I'll just talk about printing the cycloid because that was, uh, that was that took a long time because there were, I think in the area, 3D printers were very hard to find. Uh, not only that, you had to obviously pay for them. So uh, I ended up asking a few friends who had 3D printers and we would spend hours putting in the correct size that so that we could get a pendulum of length 30 centimeters. But no matter what, I think I had two that ended up happening and they ended up being the size of the whole cycloid was the size of my finger um, because 3D printers have a large limit. So uh, there was a high school in a nearby county that had a 3D printer and uh, they let me use it for free, which surprised me. But I ended up creating, uh, I think you can, I'll stop sharing actually. All right, so this so was why, the what, what is 30 centimeter? What's the role of 30 centimeters? Yes. Um, so I think I said somewhere, right. So the length of the pendulum would equal four times the radius. So we wanted that length to be 30 centimeters. Um, uh, it, should, it would just have been much easier to measure, but there was a lot of error in terms of printing this cycloid. And I mean, not just with the radius that we got, but uh, I'm not sure if you can get a great view, uh, but you can see that the surface itself is not there. There's plenty of bumps around the edges. You can see this right here. And if you look closely, there's just so many ridges and like areas in there that are obviously not ideal uh, because I mean, that, that was just printing. That's just how it went. Um, but this ended up being the best model I got because it actually had a decent size that we could use. And so I think what ended up happening was it it it, it would it wasn't right for thirty centimeters. Uh, I'll go back to sharing my screen. So it, it ended up not being good for thirty centimeters. So what we did was we um, I think you might see like little black marks around the pendulum. We uh, I st stuck like little strings inside of it and measured out like height, the X, Y, and uh, the X and the Z. And I was able to plug it into this, the 2D equations. And I was able to get, I was able to get the, uh, the radius and the length, which came out to be 27.4 centimeters. And, and now I guess I can move on to, uh, go back here. I think I can move on to just the experiment in general. Um, Yes, so in terms of the experiment, right, so I used fishing line. I'll, I'll just go through the specs. So it was this, um, there was a fishing line and a metallic bob. And then I have some pictures of the setup we had. Uh, let me share my screen again. Quick question. 
Why yeah. did you decide to print the cycloid as a as as a circle? It was sufficient to do it as a planar as a cylindrical cycloid. Cycloid, right? Was that an option? Did you did you think on that or yes? Just um, yeah, no. The uh, well, once you release it, since we don't have that great accuracy with releasing it. It will, uh, it may start like this with its uh, oscillations. We ended up timing it for 10 oscillations. So um, it would end up um, just, there's like a back, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I mean, this is like the back of the setup and it would end up it, usually around the 11th or 12th oscillation, the bob would crash into the back because it was slowly rotating. So that way, it would have been, it's much easier if we have a, I guess, a circular surface, a 3D surface. And was that rotation consistent? Always it did that in the same direction or was it just random? It always turned clockwise. Um, the larger amplitude you released it by, it would turn more. Uh, that's what we discovered. The smaller amplitudes didn't really turn. So because for 10 oscillations, I wouldn't expect it to go around so much well yeah. it could yeah. be it could be mistakes uh, like i mean bunch of mistakes that can like uh, occur right like the pivot point might be the not uh, like nicest pointed one the way you are releasing is not the great way right, i think yeah. i think the the the, uh, the trouble with this printing like that as you are seeing like uh, he's not able to print the uh, cycloid for the complete shape like it is truncated like height wise it is very much truncated yes. pendulum otherwise like what happens is that whatever is the diameter you see of the bottom circle your pendulum will just come right at that level like oh. that particular plane every pendulum for a cycloid the length of that pendulum is fixed by this uh, bottom rim uh, I see. So that is a necessary condition, right? It's is a necessary it? condition. And printers are not that big, right? So you cannot have an entirely big surface. So there are a couple of problems. And I think like one of the, uh, I think later I thought over it and I think it is, it would have been nice if we had made the pendulum upside down. So that like, I mean, printer has, printer gives the, what do you call it? Like 3D printing gives you the base, like support bases, right? And all mm. of the support bases were given on the interior side, which caused caused a lot of like yes, roughness. Surface. Because, uh, yeah, go like ahead. done it the other way, like it would have been much, much nicer. And um, right, because when they 3D print, um, what like all these ridges that were in here are also caused by the fact that when they 3D print, they just they don't just print the surface; they print bases inside of it to stabilize and then they have to rip out all those bases so that will cause the grooves and ridges and that so yeah if we had those on the outside they wouldn't have affected the thing um i'll just talk about setting it up so uh this was just a cardboard setup taped to a wall and uh, but you could have filled the hole of up thing with a solid right that was sufficient we didn't need a surface right only on one side we didn't we needed a surface. Would that be a, a better option to print if you had filled up the whole of the upper region? Yeah, if we had printed it upside down the way he was trying to show the mathematical file, instead of doing yeah. this inverted, we should have printed it like we should have thought about printing it upside down. So yeah, and yeah, have... it would work if you filled the hole. Um, yes, that would work. Um, in fact, then it would mean almost no supports, although I think the price would definitely go up in terms of plastic used. But yeah, I mean, I'll just go into like how we set this up. So the simple pendulum was very uh, simple. It was simply, it, we, I measured out with fishing line 27.4 centimeters and just taped it from the top. And uh, I was able to release that for the cycloidal pendulum. I had to use earth magnets to hold up the string and the cycloid at the same time. And then you, you might, that's at the top. And then you might see here some paper clips that I've been to hold up the cycloid. Um, 
those are attached from the top too. And then, and then you can see these like black lines over here. Um, basically, I took a protractor and I took some paper and I uh, drew out the angles that I wanted to have them released at as long as possible. And then I like stayed back and made sure they were released at the right point and then we would time them. So it would be released and they would be timed for 10 oscillations. Um, and then we ended up dividing this time by 10. Uh, I think this got me into a little bit of trouble with the uh, the fair because um, I, I measured the values to the hundredth because that was the least count measure of the stopwatch. But then I would divide it by 10. And so I'd have a value that was to the thousandth and they didn't like that. They said all values had to be the, to the hundredth, but that was what we did in in terms of setting up and timing the experiment. It was just a stopwatch, me using my hands and uh, doing, yes, yeah, so that's what we did. So yeah, that was the experiment. And then I, I guess I'll just show the, uh data so sorry I, I might have missed it but what, what was the point of dividing by 10 on the stopwatch oh yes yeah. so uh, we just did 10 oscillations so oh, to I get see. the time period of one you just uh, okay divide. so um uh, let me share again sorry okay so this is just a data table that i use to analyze my data and um so here we have the angle uh 10 to, uh we measured from 10 to 70 and there were five trials each was conducted of 10 oscillations and i averaged out the values for the simple pendulum and i averaged out the values for the cycloidal pendulum and so um you can measure the percent error of the cycloidal pendulum to what was expected so uh, I forgot to do this actually. Um, uh, this is simple. We just take 27.4 centimeters and we have our original equation for this cycloidal pendulum. And once you plug this in uh, for the length, everything else is given, uh, you get right here. Sorry. 1.051 seconds. And so this is what, this is the theoretical value. And this is what everything was tested against. Um, Question, so when you say error, what is the reference? What is the correct value for you? This is the correct value, 1.051 second. So T is equal to L over G, that's the reference. Yes, yes. That would be the reference. So um, let me share again. Yeah, no, I was just showing the reference value there. So uh, these were these values were all compared to that, and you get percent error. And so what you're looking at is the approximate uh, this column versus this column, and uh, we see that it's it starts at two point one and ends up at seven here, seven percent error. And for the cycloidal pendulum, we we so we do see error, which means it's not perfect. Um, I did have a data table somewhere to. Um, uh, I forgot this, but are you sure for the cycloidal pendulum uh, also this was the same value that was used and not the actual theoretical value? Yes, uh, I was going to. Ex yeah, I I'll actually explain that now. Um, I mean, I can show you this graph though. So there uh, is a. Sorry, so Neil, so this this expression for time period is same even for cycloidal pendulum. E is no. to 2 pi by L no, over G. I don't think so. Can you go back in your slide and yeah, see yeah, what I'll, the time I'll, period is? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes. Okay. So that equation, which is right here, this is for the cycloidal pendulum. Um, this no, is what that, that equation is for simple pendulum, which is the, yeah, which is is the time period equation for the cycloidal okay. pendulum. I think it must be in your slide somewhere. Yeah, yes. Um, it is right. I was, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, there it is. Let me enlarge on this. Right. Sorry, that was way too big. Yeah. 
So that would be, I, I have it written as that's the simple pendulum. Um, and that. No, this is the cycloidal pendulum time period, which is exact. And a, you calculate against this, like this is the expected result for each angle. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't this be, though, we made the small angle approximation for the simple pendulum derivation. So wouldn't that be, I, I guess I'm confused. If Because if t equals 2 pi L over G, if this is given the small angle approximation, that's independent of the simple pendulum, right? Uh, you're confusing two things. So you on your table, you have like... Uh, different columns, right? One is related with the simple pendulum right. for which you use two pi or times the square root of L over G, which is 1.051 seconds. Yes. Yeah. So all the errors are measured against that value. But for the cycloidal pendulum, you plugged in value for each theta in this equation and got a numerical value with Mathematica. Um, I th that might have been what happened. I remember I was going to show um this right here so uh the blue is what the actual results were the tested results for the cycloidal pendulum and the red is the tested results for the symbol pendulum and this was compared to the uh this goldish function and the blue was compared to this bluish function um and this was the yes this was the theoretical value shown here so i i, I guess i must have just flipped the two um and when explaining, but yeah, uh, I, I guess you can just generalize from when you look at the slope of these two functions. Uh, if the closer it is to a flat value, sorry, if the um, the closer it is to a zero slope, the more isochronous it would be, since it's simply going over uh, from ten degrees amplitude to seventy degrees amplitude. So, since this has a larger overall slope and this has a smaller overall slope. The cycloidal pendulum was more isochronous. Um, I I wanted to show this video, which is uh, I took it uh, two years ago. I think it's at the wrong timing, actually. But uh, I think um, we sent this in the group chat for Sphix. But if you just um, it's ten seconds long, and it, it shows. Uh, on the it shows 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 degrees for the simple pendulum and cycloidal pendulum. And you'll just you can see that the cycloidal pendulum's results are far more in sync than the simple pendulum. Um, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70 degrees. And using a stopwatch to time 10 oscillations. I did five trials for each amplitude. So, uh, in the pendulum bob at 10. I'll show 20, it again. So 30, simple pendulum 40, 50, 60, over here, 70. it's just at this point, they're completely out of sync. Using a stopwatch and cycloidal pendulum is still I decently. For each they do still Plus follow seven. each other pretty well. Um, so I think that's that's what really showed me that they were decently isochronic, that they were far more isochronous than the simple pendulum. Um, I think that it was that video like of them aligned together uh, that showed me that. But, Did you send us the same video in Sphix? Is it the same one? Yeah, I think um, th there was some problem with the video. Uh, I'll I'll look into it. But um, yeah, there was some problem with the video. I'll look into it. That was sent in Sphix. Um, but yes, I think I, I just wanted to also go over uh, perhaps errors. And so... And uh, Emil, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, I'll have to take your leave because there's a meeting that I'm supposed to attend at 12. Okay, <laughs> Shadesh, uh, I'll have to uh, go okay. for a meeting right now. Okay, so I'll have to take a leave. Sorry, but I enjoyed the talk. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a meeting Bye. waiting for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Bye. Okay. So this was a, one of the slides I made um, that was part of the slideshow and it showed my error analysis. And um, this was a, sorry. So I one should... question on the previous uh, point you were making. So if it was a, if you had tried earlier, whatever you were thinking of, you said because of the shift in the axis, 
or axis, plane axis, you decided to not do the cylindrical siloid, cycloid. Yeah. If you had done a cylindrical cycloid, it would have been possible to keep all this in a line and make them go about, right? It would that be, was that considered at all? All of them at the same time? Is that, is that yeah. what you think? Yeah, yeah. It was considered, Shashish. Yeah. It was considered, it just was not feasible. I see. Yeah. Like rely, it, it, it wasn't reliable as he's saying, because I mean, you can try to release it. Like, let's say you take a ruler and you try to release all of them at the same time, but there is no guarantee that it is uh, like, it's going to be like all in same plane and like get tangled up or something else. The bobs are wide, they would crash and into then, each other. And, um, then you have and to, the trouble is like, what is the angle? Like Yes, you have to get seven amplitudes perfectly like at the same what time. What is the angle? Like you cannot be very sure about what angle you're releasing each my, bob. My and then you is, have to, I have seen this video as a simulation at various places. It's very impressive. It, it conveys the point just in half a minute. My point is, can this be physically achieved now that you have the experience of all this? Can I, I you think, I think so, actually yeah. mechanically do this? Yeah, so illustrate? if I were to do it, um, I would get seven bobs. I would make, I'm, I'm assuming this isn't, is this for a cycloidal setup or? Cycloidal setup. So, okay. So I would, if I wanted to do this, I would have to 3D print. I'd have to splice a much bigger cycloid into many different parts. I would take seven different things. I would measure out the seven different amplitudes and I would use the uh, rope system. So, I mean, all you have to do is uh, position a rope that holds them at their seven perfect amplitudes. You tie them together and then you just burn them all at once and they'll be released at once. Um, uh, that's obviously, a, it's a lot of work. Um, it, it's a lot of time, but it's definitely possible. Um, I think 3D printing all these different cycloid parts would be costly, but it's it's definitely possible. Yes. Has anyone achieved this? Has there been a video of a mechanical cycloidal pendulum illustrating the independence of amplitude? Does it exist? I, I haven't. I mean, I, I know like I made that like little thing of every all of them next to each other, but I haven't seen anyone do seven or however many at one time. Um, so it's worth pursuing it. Yeah, I mean, I sure. plan to. I yes. plan to print it. The okay, two great. Two so you you print. you have the. Uh, I still have that. I got the three D printed one, a much bigger, larger one than Neil's is, but it was done in like four different parts because printers cannot print print big ones. Right. Yeah. But I do plan to make like the cyl cylindrical surface, and then. Nice. So all so, the mistakes that happened or all the, like in hindsight, whatever I learned with his project, I am going to implement again. So and, this is a work in progress that means it's nowhere. Yeah. It's yeah, not, yeah. like, yeah, it's not closed from my side. Yeah, I will print it. I want to display it in my classroom, so yeah. Perfect, okay, okay. thanks. Yeah, it sounds, that sounds good. Um, I, I guess I'll just continue with, errors. Uh, this was just my error analysis that I made at the time. Um, and the main error that theoretically, I guess you see in the formula was the length. And so we created this formula. And uh, notably, what you realize is a 5% change in the length means a 2.5% change in the time period. And this is roughly a 2% error per centimeter. So what we see is in... Oh my goodness. Sorry. Uh, in the printing of the cycloid, um, when we are measuring this radius, which is obviously not, um, it ended up not being what was expected. Um, any little change in that radius since, I mean, all the values, technically they are very close to each other. It's, it's you know, 1.03, 1.04, 1.06. So a small, um, sorry, where was that slide? Yes, a small change in the radius would mean a large change in the time period. So uh, I would say that the main error that we had was the um, 
most likely the error in the uh, measuring of the length of the pendulum. Now, of course, there's like small errors releasing least count error, you know, but these were accounted for as much as possible. 10 oscillations, five trials, taking the average of everything. So um, I think it can't be the main source of error, right? The length, because the derivation of this equation assumed that you have a cycloidal surface and that surface was not perfect so this equation is not perfect so indirectly it depends on the cycloid shape yeah would i be right i mean i think the length has contribution to it because i mean we did show statistically that the smallest change in length could result in a large change in the time period. So, I mean, that is, I think that is a possibility, but I feel like we've also shown that the length could have a large effect. And when measuring the cycloid, we did have a problem with the length and getting the correct radius to be able to do it. But I mean, if I were to, um, if I were to sum everything up, I would say that it's, it's a pretty, I think it's something that any high most high school students could do in terms of the fact that the deriving the equation is very simple. It's um, and that uh, when you're setting up the experiment, uh, it's um, once it's set up and it, it it's proven that it has worked decently well. Um, you know, I was able. This was my first time doing like an actual like an actual science fair. Um, obviously, with the help of uh, uh, Dr. Rachi, but this, um, I mean, I guess you can get like, experimental techniques. Um, because if it is the length, as we said earlier, you might be able to take a very long pendulum and reduce the error. But right. I suspect yes. that the error in the cycloidal pendulum is mainly not coming from the length, it is the shape of the cycloid itself that is causing the. Uh, error. Yeah, that's that's also possible. I, I think and you haven't are... taken L equal to four R, right? That's yeah. Not... I mean, the the length is dependent on the shape, though, right? Like the shape, they, they are correlated because uh, I I use the shape of the cycloid to determine the length. So, uh, and then yeah, I, I think we mentioned that earlier. The length, a large, a much larger length would obviously mean a much smaller error. So when doing this. We tried to make the cycloid as big as possible according to their the printer that they own in order to have the um, as less error as possible with the length. So is it possible to have a, have a cycloid without using a 3D printer, like physically carving it out? Is that possible? Like yeah. because 3D printer has this limitation that it can be only probably 30 centimeters big also. I mean, I, I just think that there's so many like shapes of cycloids on the internet. And so if you were to if you were to print one out and if you made like a tool um with that shape and say you had like whatever material you wanted to use, clay or whatever, and you just take the shape and just press down, you could create, I mean, like yeah, I guess you could create a shape without having to 3D print. Uh, yes, I would say. Would that be more viable as a... No, not not more viable. No, like I, you will have to take help from professionals. Like 3D printing is something which everybody can work with. Exactly. Like it is the easiest uh, available tool to anybody to create any kind of equipment that they need. But... I was saying, suppose I take a wheel and put a pencil on it and on a wooden surface, just mark the point that is rotating. Yeah, and who is going and, to and, do the and, and who use is going a, to do the cutting of the wood? And who is going to like I mean, uh, like polish it, like grind it, sand it? Like this is a lot of work. A I, I, yeah, I don't think it's like I don't think it's impossible, but it, given the scale that you'd be trying to achieve, um, I mean, you'd want it to be as big as possible. And so, I mean, that if it was just one of us doing it and you had like a simple wood cutting machine with that scale, it would be very difficult. So 
I think you want some kind of position here. Like wouldn't that, would you would you agree that wood cutting is easier than three D printing or the other way? I I just well. Is it easier than 3D printing? Yes, but I mean, at the same time, if you're trying to achieve a, a, a very large scale, it's it's not going to work, I think, unless you have a professional doing it. Like why wood cutting? Then one can ask like, why not mold a metal? Yes, molding. Uh, out yeah. of like, get a perfect a smooth surface and everything. Like this is, this can be bettered like in which, whichever way, right? Like it can be made better. But uh, the trouble is like how easy it is to just do with things which are available in in your house or nearby, like and like not taking too much help from outside. So like there are certain things you have to talk like okay are we trying to do a precision, like really really precision experiment? If yes, which is what it would, we hoped it will work out to be, but it didn't because of so many like issues but uh yeah like at the same time like it was supposed to be an eighth graders work right yeah i mean the concept i i would say the concept was there but i mean yeah now it's if you want to make it as precise as possible um it's scaling it's i mean now that there's experience it's much easier so Do you have any experience with wood cutting, Neil? I mean, simple little, like little prints of like things that are this size, but I mean, not nothing that would be very large. No. I mean, uh, anyone could just have a wood cutting machine. You like press it through and then you sand it. It's that's not too difficult, but that's for if you're doing some small little project at home. When it comes down to making a giant cycloid of this precise shape, it's just not really. Because they had in 16th century buildings with cycloid shaped uh, uh, arches, right? So there might be ways to do it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'll let you proceed here. Like, I was just wondering if it is a better option to use a wood cutting. Uh, option, uh, yeah, uh, to use a wood cutting to do this over a 3D printer. And I mean, also, that's more costly. I mean, it's definitely. I think it is possible. I mean, you just like a 3D printer, it's going to take time. You have to slice, sorry, splice different things together, um, because you're not going to do. I mean, what if you're thinking of a shape that's going to be actually very accurate and like a very good size, you're going to need a very big cycloid and you're going to want the cycloid to cover the entire length of the pendulum. And so it's not going to be very, if you want to have all seven in line or what, however many you're doing. So it's, you still have to figure out how to attach different parts of wood together as well um, when creating it. Like my point is that if it is true that it has never been demonstrated at a mechanical level, then why not put in the effort and time and money? Like I've seen simulations and they are very impressive, very illustrative. So mechanically, if it can be done every time you pull it and leave it, that will be cool. Yeah. But yeah, that's my comment. I, I didn't have anything else uh, to present. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Good. So how did you come up with this talk? No, uh, that was I, you and uh, uh, yeah, that's the project, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, good job. What's yeah. the time there? Hmm? No. I think there's a clock above you. If you stop the recording, Shajish. Uh...
No, no, very, very good. I mean, it's really nice. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you stop the recording now, please? <laughs>